Savvy Young Professional Podcast. My name is Tanita Mullen, and I am your podcast host for this amazing, epic show. I want you guys to know that we have been on a little bit of a hiatus, doing some rebranding, working on how to reboot and revamp this show. But I have not stopped talking to really amazing people that can help you become a better professional by just listening to this podcast. So on this particular show, we're going to talk to someone who went from the medical field all the way to now book maven and coach, business coach helping people become better at running their businesses. Stay tuned to this episode. And if you're looking for more, make sure you go to the SavvyYoungProfessional.com and also on YouTube. I'll catch you later. Welcome to the show, Danielle. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk to you today, um, especially just, you know, having a conversation with you before we started recording. And it sounds like your story is pretty unique because you actually referred to yourself as the, an accidental entrepreneur. So why don't you give everybody a little bit of um, a rundown of you and your business and kind of how you ended up an accidental entrepreneur? Sure. So I think there's this this myth that everyone goes to business school and gets out of school and maybe gets an MBA and then starts a company. And I'm so not that kind of entrepreneur. And a lot of the people I know and do business with aren't those kinds of entrepreneurs either. So I was supposed to be a cardiologist and have a bachelor's degree in biology, but um, I missed med school by three seats and ended up um, in a sales job. And in that sales job, I ended up meeting my husband, which was a silver lining in that whole failure. And after we got married, I had trouble changing my name. It actually took me three trips to get my new name on my driver's license. And I was just so frustrated by the waste of time that I had thought to myself, why isn't there turbo tax for name change? Why isn't there a service to pay to do this for you? And out of that frustration and that idea came the company Miss Now Misses. And so almost 10 years ago is when I, I launched the company and we have steadily grown to 300,000 customers in two countries. And basically what we do is condense the 13-hour tedious name change process into 30 minutes for $30. Wow, that is definitely accidental. <laughs> And it's pretty unique because I never thought about that as a service. I mean, there's so many things that are out there that helps um, processes run smoother and people's lives easier. And I could just imagine how just having a service like that has gotten you to um, the level of business that you are today. Yeah, it's it's one of those, as soon as you talk to someone who's been married, they're like, oh, I wish I had known, or that's such a good idea. It's it's like paying your taxes. Everyone can do it themselves, but it's a lot of paperwork. No one understands it, and no one wants to make a mistake. Exactly, especially not with a new last name. I mean, I can't even imagine <laughs> what it would be like trying to correct that mistake. So you you got into entrepreneurship, and... You said that it was an accident. So how did you how did you feel as you started to make that transition, especially when it being accidental? Like, how did you know that this was going to be it? Like, I'm not going back. I'm going to continue my entrepreneurial lifestyle. So it's not like the movies. I didn't have the business idea and immediately quit my job and, you know, hire 20 people and live in a fabulous house and office. Um Quite the contrary, I did evenings and weekends doing the research, figuring out, you know what, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only person that had trouble changing my name. And, you know, how many people actually do change their name? And it turns out that 88% of brides in the U.S. change their name. So there's a lot of people. And from all of the different blogs and all of the different chat rooms, because this was a long time ago, um, it turns out that everyone hated the process and there was a real need for, for a solution. And so I didn't quit my job in corporate America until about three months before we launched because the company really needed all of my attention and focus to, to actually happen. But uh, within 30 minutes, we had our first customer, Wendy. And at that moment, I realized that I had made a huge life change and there was no going back. Wow, that's great. And you mentioned something pretty interesting in that 
when you said, you know, it wasn't like the movies. And especially in today's time where it's just a very um, large and fast growing entrepreneurial spirit and culture. It's all about the startup. It's all about, you know, having a, a schedule that's flexible and working on your own terms. I think that, and this is just me talking to other people as well, you know, there's this perception that you are supposed to have the big idea, quit the job, and, you know, become this huge success, or have the big idea, quit the job, but it's a a storybook struggle, and then you hit this success. So um, can you just speak a little bit more to people? Because I know that there's somebody that is that has an idea or has already pushed an idea into the universe, but they maybe have fell in love with the storybook um, romance of the entrepreneurial lifestyle that is being played out in so many magazines and blogs and just even movies. I mean, when you think about something like um, the Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg movie, I mean, even that was kind of the romanticized entrepreneurial story. What would you tell someone who is maybe thinking that it's going to be like that? What, would, what piece of advice would you give them? I love that you use the word fairy tale. There's actually a chapter in my book that's called Don't Fall in Love with Your Idea Before Holding It Accountable. So I would tell all of your listeners that entrepreneurship is an amazing lifestyle. There are some huge perks. There are There's flexibility. There's being your own boss. There's having the power to have an idea and make it happen. On the flip side, a lot of those those joyous parts come later. The part that comes early is the hard part, the part where you don't have money, where you need to figure out if there's a market for your product, where you have to iterate. The first thing you put out is never exactly what the customer wants, and you need to be able to understand what they need and build what they need and have the personal resilience to be like, this is going to work. I'm going to make it work. I am not going to let it fail. So it's not a fairy tale. It's also not a formula. Like You have to have that good idea, and you have to be very passionate and committed and know that that the hard work will pay off. It just might not pay off in 48 hours. Right, great. I'm so happy that you said that as well. I think we all, um, even even in our corporate life sometimes, um, we kind of all think, well, if I go to this training, if I get this degree, if I work this program or these years, or if I do this for the boss and you know, make sure I'm always there and you know, there early and I leave late, that I'm just going to roll into a promotion. And so I think that, Something that we can all learn from your entrepreneurial story is that there's a process to everything that you do. <laughs> very, very much so. And know what you want and connect the dots. Figure out what you need to do. And it can be really daunting if you're like, oh my gosh, there's like 35 steps to get from where I am to where I want to be. Just get to the next step and then the next step. By breaking it into little pieces, it becomes more manageable. To beat the overwhelm. Absolutely. Several times you've already mentioned your book, and I want to go into that because I think that, you know, when we first started to communicate and I and it was looking on your website and I was talking to you, um, most people will go and they'll see, okay, well, you know, your your biggest audience or your, your target audience is women. But, you know, so far we... We all know that all the lessons that we learn now are, you know, they apply across the board. So the book, um, tell, tell me about the book. How did you get to the idea that I'm going to write a book? And, um, you know, just a little bit of history about that. Sure. So I am at heart a problem solver, and that helps in entrepreneurship. And so... I had a a problem with the word entrepreneur. I never quite owned it. I was like, well, I had this business idea. I run a small business. I have a software company because I never felt like I deserved the the title because I didn't go to business school. And it took longer than I cared to admit years uh, to really own that. And as soon as I did, a lot of really great things happened for my company and for me personally. And so in that struggle, I read so many business books And I learned a lot, but I never found the one I was looking for. And the book I was looking for was, uh, here's how to build a business as a smart woman without an MBA. Here's the 12 steps. Here's how it feels. Here's advice from 28 other amazing female founders like Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank. And so I had mentioned, you know, hey, there should be a book like this. And uh, a good friend of mine who knows me quite well was like, Danielle, you should write that book. 
And I'm like, if I couldn't call myself an entrepreneur for five years, how can I possibly write a business book? And what she said is the reason the book happened. She looked at me and said, think of all the women who were just like you that will never start their own businesses if you don't write this book. So that is that is the impetus and the spark. I wanted to solve the problem that more women, and, and men too, I love men as well, but men more traditionally do start companies. But when women do, they're actually more successful statistically. Wow. So you decided that this was kind of that give back in that, you know, I need to tell the world the story so that I can inspire and um, maybe change someone else's life. Exactly. If one person reads the book and starts a company and has changed his or her life, it was worth it. And from different reviews on Amazon and emails and tweets that I receive, it's already happening and it's really cool. Okay, so we're not going to give you all the juicy, juicy details of every chapter because if we did that, then that means you wouldn't go buy the book. But... We did. I, you know, we had our, our conversation a little bit right before the podcast started. And there are a few chapters that relate specifically to the young professional. And so we're going to go into those. And Danielle, I'll let you introduce the, the first chapter and then you can introduce the second if you'd like. But um, in your opinion, would this this particular chapter, um, you felt like it related to maybe someone in the, the beginning of their careers. Um, what was the chapter? So it's um, it's a subchapter of, of chapter seven of Elegant Entrepreneur, and it's have a good idea and act upon it daily. Okay. So as an entrepreneur, you have this big idea that starts a company, and then you need to come up with all these ideas every day and make them happen to keep that company alive. And as a young professional, I worked in corporate America, and it's important to understand the big idea that started the company you're working for. And then to have your own ideas every day about how you can help that company. Think about what you do every single day. Think about time you waste. And instead of just looking at it as a problem, come up with an idea or a solution that that would save you time and let you do something more meaningful for the company and present that. Everyone's always looking for thought leaders or idea makers or uh, intrapreneurs is the new is the new buzzword for that. So, as a young professional, look at the problems you face in your in your specific job role. Come up with those solutions and and have them happen. And then personally, think about what you want to do. What what good idea do you have for yourself today? Are you going to take a walk around the building during your lunch break instead of just sitting at your computer? Are you going to start a project in your house that you've been telling yourself you're going to do? So having the ideas is half of it. Fulfilling the ideas and making them happen is the other half. And if you can do that, you'll be successful, whether you're an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, working in corporate America, or just in your own personal life. I absolutely love the idea of doing something daily. And the reason why is because I know from personal experience that especially when you work in a very fast-paced industry, sometimes ideas are always coming to you. They might be in a book. It might be at an event. It could be, you know, just inspiration from working in a team setting and I see it all the time where people get so excited about something and their brains are going and they come up with 20 different good ideas and then the very next day it's like it never happened (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there's it's it's loss. Like you just have to do it. And it's it's inertia. A body in motion stays in motion. So as you're like get used to having these ideas and implementing them for yourself, for your company, for your team, um it gets easier and your trajectory is much much higher. Yeah. I love that. And you're absolutely right. It's you know, it's when you're busy, it's when you're in the thick of things that you seem to get all the things on your to-do list that you had you know, on your list when you had plenty of time, but they never got done, but somehow you make them happen when you're the busiest. And I love the idea of doing something daily. Um, If I were, or if the person listening to this podcast is someone that maybe just started or very entry level, and maybe they don't have a strong area of influence just yet, give me some examples of things that they can do daily to stand out and maybe build that influence. So I can give a great example um, from my company, from Miss Now Mrs. So we had a, you know, customer support girl 
pretty new, like three weeks into the job. And she impressed me beyond belief. She uh, she kept a tally of of the responses she was getting on the phone. She wasn't just you know answering questions. She's like, well, what would you like? What would you? What do you wish that we did? Which is not something we trained her to do, but we now train everyone to do. And um, tallied up you know a month's worth of data and came to me and was like, Danielle. Um, I've, I've, I've been surveying quietly the, the customers that I've handled on customer support, and there's a new product idea, and I think it's something that you should look at. And that new product idea is now 30% of our bottom line, and she got an immediate raise and has now um, heading customer support. Wow. That is a perfect example. And I love that. I love the idea of just making it happen and not necessarily needing permission or needing a validation. but just Right, and it was it little. Works. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was tiny. It wasn't like, oh, I've and she the way she presented it, she wasn't like you have to do this. I'm going to be I'm going to be your partner. She's like, "Hey, I've and she spent a month getting the data. I love data." So the way she did it and the, just that she took the initiative in her job to see what could be done better uh made all the difference. Excellent. So that's the first chapter and like I said guys, we're not going to give it all away because we really do want you to go and purchase the book and you spoke about another chapter that you thought would be pretty influential. So I'll let you lead us into that as well. Sure. Um, So it's called Lean Into Your Startup to Stand Upright for Yourself. So I would think a lot of you listeners, especially you lady listeners, um, are familiar with the book Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. I read it. I liked it. It's all about excelling in corporate America as a woman. Um, Sheryl had a lot of great things to say, but I think if you apply her principles differently, you're going to end up a lot happier. So, you know, Cheryl wrote this great book. She's at Facebook. She's a COO. She writes in her book that she was afraid to take maternity leave because she thought she would lose her job. And I would say that if she had founded that company, she wouldn't have been afraid at all because it would have been her company and her decisions. So with that, I like to get women, especially women in corporate America, to think outside the box a little bit. We all know what the next promotions are. We all know which office we want. But the world is changing. And as a female founder, it's scary at the beginning, but you have all of a sudden the power to decide what's important, how fast you're going to build your business. You can take time to take care of a family member who's ill, to travel, to start another company, or start a family without any of the guilt, because you are the person creating the company and creating what your definition of success is. You're not trying to fit a square peg into a round hole of what you want into what, what the company you're working for deems as successful. Wow. Yep. That's very true. And I think... Even with that, I think there's a there's a certain way that you can do that if you are comfortable or if you do still work in corporate America. It's just making yourself, um, you know, indispensable, making yourself someone that no matter what time you need off or decision that you make, that people are going to want to work with you to a point to where you just, you know, They don't care if you take the time or if you need to leave or those types of things. And I think it works both ways. Entrepreneurial, the entrepreneur uh, lifestyle is definitely more flexible. And I know there's more rewards in that. Um, But I I do believe that if you have the skills that you can kind of live that, you know, entrepreneurial lifestyle that you were saying um, within a business, um, depending on who you're working for. And that kind of leads me into my next question. You know, there is, we talked about it a little bit earlier, there is this different culture in the work world. And I want, this is actually the first person that I've, I've been able to ask this question to. As a business owner and as someone that has worked in corporate America, what are your feelings about the fact that, the, that companies are now starting to work and try to accommodate the entrepreneurial lifestyle with flex schedules and with relaxed dress codes and with unlimited vacation. Um, How do you feel about that? So I feel like it's a very interesting time to be living and working in. Um, 
corporate America is in trouble and they know it. Um, as millennials, we don't want to do the things our parents and grandparents and great grandparents did the same way. The things that are important to us are very different. And so it's good to see that there's this sort of change in the inner workings of these big companies and that they're exploring these different ways to engage employees and, and make them happy and a happy employee is a healthy employee who's going to be at work and have great ideas. So I think it's going to be a slow process um, as I've worked in a very large corporate America company. But um, I love that they're they're at least trying and tiptoeing into the lifestyle. Um, there's never going to be the same satisfaction for an employee that you know is still working and like you have those ideas that you can't make happen. But there's also a lot of security and hopefully as things change a lot more flexibility to be as successful as you deem success to be. Exactly. I think that's a really good point. And I, I always wanted to know, especially um, someone who has made a transition, um, what their, what the thoughts and feelings were about that. Because I think companies, like you said, they, they know that they have work to do. But I also believe that there is definitely a clear line between um, owning a business and being an entrepreneur and working for someone else or in someone else's business. So I, I thought that was a pretty uh, pretty interesting take on, on everything. So we're wrapping up on our interview, and, I, you know, I, I want to ask you personally, when you were moving towards your entrepreneurial lifestyle, what the things were that influenced you. So besides your book, because we know everybody's going to get that. We already gave you some really good teasers. Besides your book, what was one of the books that was maybe influential to you or something that maybe you, I wish I, I wish I wrote this book, you know, just something that really stood out to you. So there is a fabulous book with like the worst title possible. It's called The Greatest Salesman in the World by Og Mandino. And it's a short little book. And it's not even written as a business book. It's written more as a story. But um, I, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it's sort of like, you know, there's this very old, incredibly wealthy, greatest salesman from a very long time ago, and he's waiting to hand down his secrets to the right person. And they're all written on these scrolls. So all of the chapters as the story progresses are the scrolls. And they're almost like a parable. And the insights that I have taken out of that professionally and also personally have been profound. So I would tell anyone to pick up a copy, read it, follow it. It's a little bit culty. You have to read the same scroll over over again for like a month so it soaks in. But um, it, it really works and it absolutely changes your mindset and, and viewpoint. I'm so glad you added that last part because I have read that book and I'm like, I don't know if I'm getting it. And I'm glad that you said you have to read it over and over again because when I first read it, that was my very first thought. I said, I got to go back. I got to read it. Yeah, no, you have to do each scroll three times a day, every day for a month. It'll take you about a year to get the whole way through it. It requires discipline. Okay. (laughs) No, I'm so happy that you said that because I remember, you know, hearing about it and I said, well, let me go ahead and order it. And I I did. I I did get drawn into the story, but I thought to myself, I was like, there's more to this. It's just kind of like The Alchemist, like, that was one of the books where I said, okay, I get this, but let me go back because I know that every time you read those type of books, you pull something different from it. So I still have some more, uh, a couple more times to read it to, for it to get to me. But I'm glad that you shared that. Before we go, I want to ask you, what does it mean to be an elegant entrepreneur because that title is so different (laughs) so if you actually flip to the first page of the book it's a definition of the word elegant and entrepreneur so it's a pleasingly ingenious and simple solution to a problem and the problem is there aren't enough women entrepreneurs and so I wanted to make their sort of creation simpler and more elegant because I always felt like I was clawing from step to step and falling and scraping my knees and just sort of barely getting there and I I hope to smooth the pathway so that there can be um, more women entrepreneurs and they can grow their companies and scale their companies in a much more elegant fashion than I did yes I can and I get that that's perfect 
I always ask my guests um, this question, and a lot of times they're not ready for it. <laughs> but if you knew back then, and that could be when you started, when you were in college, when you you know made the made the career shift um, from what it, what you're doing, what you were going to do to what you're doing now, whatever that means to you. But if you knew then what you know now, like what would you tell yourself? What what piece of advice would you give yourself at that time? Wow. Um, <laughs> take some marketing and business and computer classes in college. That would have been really wise. Um, I think I would have told myself to do the things that I didn't think I could do. So, so one of my favorite quotes is she who dares wins. And, you know, now that I'm hitting 30, like I, I own that and I didn't then. So I would have told my younger self to be more daring and take more risks because the worst that can happen is to grow old and always wonder what if. Yep. That's, that's perfect. That is really good advice. Before um, we wrap up, and I don't know why I keep saying before we wrap up. <laughs> this is really interesting. Um, it's been a while. It's been a while. My audience knows when they hear this, they're going to be like, okay, Tanita, like, this is why you need to be producing a show daily because <laughs> I'm acting like I'm a little brand new at this. But um, I want you to go ahead and tell everybody where they can find you, where they can find the book, where they can find you online, um, and just how to reach you. Because a lot of the times people listen to the podcast, they want more, they want to reach out, they want to tweet you, they want to talk to you. Absolutely. So the book is Elegant Entrepreneur, The Female Founder's Guide to Starting and Growing Your First Company. It's a mouthful. It's available on Amazon as a paperback, as a Kindle download, or you can also listen to it as an audio book in your car or as you're commuting, which is a huge thing to do. Um, I'm available. You can find me. Uh, website is elegantentrepreneur.co. No M. Uh, there's a little pop-up. Put in your email address. I always do a female founder newsletter about interesting things that's happening, um, inspirational stories, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, also on the website, there's a contact page. Feel free to drop me a line that way. I love hearing from people. On Facebook, it's Facebook forward slash Elegant Entrepreneur. Twitter, I'm Elegant underscore Entra. And then on Instagram, I'm always posting motivational quotes, memes, and interesting stuff. And that's um, Elegant Entrepreneur as well. Danielle, thank you so much for joining us on the Savvy Young Professional Podcast. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. It was awesome. Now that is what I call savvy young professional advice thank you so much for listening to this podcast and if you enjoy this show make sure you go to the savvy young professional.com you can find us on twitter on facebook you can also find us on youtube looking forward to producing these shows and i'll catch you later see you later yps <laughs>